Well, we're uh, starting in a new series. It's going to go on for a couple months, and we're going to look at relationships. And and um, I've always been reluctant to do relationship uh, sermons and series because it's they seem to be rather people oriented and uh, are need oriented. And I, I try to keep things Christ centered and biblically oriented and and that's what I'm going to try to do with this series on relationships. I I read a book a few years ago by a guy named Tom Holliday called The Relationship Principles of Jesus and I just want to come out at the beginning and say that I'm going to use some of this stuff out of his book. I'm not as smart as what I will appear to be. I know that that's going to shock some of you but I'm going to use some of his stuff out of his book because the the lens that he used to look at relationships and look at Jesus was different than anything that I'd ever seen before. And it's it's all how we, the lens that you use to look at Scripture, sometimes you just don't see what's going on because you're not looking for that. And he he looked at what Jesus said and what he did in his relationships. And what he what he found out in that was that Jesus knows a lot about relationships. And Jesus is good at everything, okay? It's like last week we, we realized that Jesus was good at fishing, right, and good at, at, at cooking. Well, this week uh, we find out that Jesus is good at, at relationships. But the thing was is that, you know, even though Jesus is a relationship expert, he relates to people a little differently than what we relate to people. Um, you, you read Scripture, and there's times when you would expect him to rebuke or correct someone and he doesn't do that. And it kind of throws you when you're noticing this. For instance, there was a time when Jesus was at this really classy kind of upper end party, dinner party, uh, with all the people that were like celebrities in Jerusalem. And as the dinner party's going on, this lady comes in. It's a prostitute. And she busts in the party. And she goes to Jesus and she does something really unthinkable you know this story where she she has this vial of really expensive perfume and she breaks this perfume and puts it on him and then she she lets her hair down you just don't do that and everybody there knows she's a prostitute she lets her hair down and she washes his feet with her hair and her tears now and all the other parties she's going to get kicked out there's no doubt about it you just can't be associated with somebody like that. I mean, that kind of thing gets around town. That's going to ruin your reputation. But you remember what Jesus did? He, his relationship with her is exactly the opposite of what we would have think, think that a good man would do. He says, I forgive you, is what he said to you. He says, your sins are forgiven to her. He uh, forgives her of the sins that she's had against other people and against God right there on the spot. You go, well, that's a lot different than what we would think. And then there's other times when we think, well, he should have been nicer to them. And we're looking for that like, you know, the disciples. He he lives with the disciples. And there's times when when he just turns on them and he kind of goes, duh, you guys aren't getting this yet. You, You still don't have enough faith. He says, what's wrong with you guys? And you think, you know, Jesus, that's not very nice. These guys have left everything and they've come to follow you. And so his relationship principles are a lot different than what we would think would be happening. And he does it differently than we do. So we're going to look at how he relates to people with with the expectation that Jesus is a relationship expert and that we can learn from him some principles of how to be in relationship with other people. Now this is an emotional subject um, because it's it's where we live. Um, I I would guess that on any given day, that we have some relationships that are at 10. That there's some people with like right now that we really get each other, we trust each other. Um, You know, there's there's honesty, there's transparency between us. We all have some 10s probably, I hope we do, on any given day. We also have some relationships that are, you know, ones or minus fives, you know, where things have suddenly gone bad and you know they're getting kind of conflictual and you know there's stuff going on and uh, you know there's we kind of like for those relationships to 
you know, to dissolve maybe, just kind of go away, but they can't go away. Sometimes they're really close to us. Sometimes we work with the people, stuff like that. But um, the other thing is the relationship, of course, that's a 10 today could in one day become a one or a minus five. I mean, it, it can happen r- rather quickly to us. So my point is that relationships are dynamic. They're always changing. They're not static. They don't stay the same no matter who it is, who you're with. I mean, things, and that, that's what makes the drama of this. And it's, it's an emotional subject. So we know the pain. We also know the joy of having a great relationship with somebody. Uh, I think it was about a month ago, you might have seen this, it's uh, Matt and Danielle, uh, the story about this young couple, and I just wanted to share something that was really good to begin with about a relationship. Uh, They had been married two months, and they they had just known each other a short period of time before they got married, and Matt uh, was in a motorcycle accident. And this is his young wife, and this shows him in the hospital after the accident, and the doctors recommended uh, to Danielle that she withdraw life support and she had the authority to do that she was his wife because they said there was a 90 percent chance that he would never come out of this coma 90 percent chance and and just picture yourself for for a minute having a spouse and you're young and you've got all these dreams of what's going to happen in life you know and you've just had your wedding and so you're, 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 all this stuff is out there and you've got it all imagined in your head and that's what's going on with Danielle. And then this happens and now that's all shattered. And not only that, but they're telling you that your husband's going to be like this. And, and this is your job now is to take care of your husband. So it's 90% chance that he's never going to come out of this coma. So you really should just say goodbye now, right? And end it. And of course, you know, the good story here is that she said no. I don't think so. I think I think God wants something else to happen in my husband's life. So she refused to take him off life support. Uh, they eventually took, kicked him out of the hospital. She took him home and, and took care of him. And in time, he woke up. Now, he's still got some therapy to go through. But we see this kind of story and go, wow. You know, that's what relationships are supposed to be like, where you have somebody that that loves you enough to hang with you when things really get tough, right? And I just wanted to show something that was was positive. And, and, you know, it's emotional because that's the power of love, a sacrificial love between two people. And it only takes a few of these stories to remind us that we were made to be in relationship with people, not just to marriage relationship but we were made to be in relationship with all kinds of people because other people to use this metaphor wake us up okay they give us hope at times they're the ones that are connected with us that we know that it's going to be okay and we all need somebody else and so it's very important and relationships are good and they are bad and the drama that's in between them is where we live day by day is with some drama Now, the first thing we learn from Jesus is about priorities. This is the principle for this week. And, you know, if we have unlimited time, if we had unlimited time, if we had unlimited energy, then priorities wouldn't be important. But we don't have unlimited time. We don't have unlimited energy or resources. So we all have to make priorities in life. And the first thing that we learn from Jesus about relationships is that they are the most important thing that everyone does. Everything else falls under relationships. Relationships are the most important, and nothing is more important than our relationships. So today we we look at, as our scripture, one of the times when Jesus was being tested. Uh, I love that people would come to him and ask him questions, and the disciples would ask him questions, and he would usually answer that. Then there would be his enemies would ask him all these test questions, you know. And it was kind of like the ancient version of trolling was what this was. And, and yet he listens to them and he answers everyone, you know, every one of these questions. And on this day, the questions are coming fast. And one group asks about paying taxes and he, you know, answers that, you know, very wisely. Another group asks a series of questions about marriage and, and Jesus handles all of these tough questions and he's brilliant. And then a teacher from the edge of the crowd asks a question that's, that's much more serious. And there seems to be a serious tone to his question. 
And this is from Mark 12, 28 to 32. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than, than, all, the, than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So his answer is so profound that he just kind of silences the crowd. And choosing these two commandments from all of the Hebrew scriptures uh, was saying that nothing is more important than relationships. He puts our relationship with God first, and then he puts our relationship with other people secondary. But nothing is more important than relationships. Nothing is more important because nothing lasts longer. Everything else goes away but relationships are eternal our relationship with God is eternal our relationship with other people is eternal they don't end now Jesus knows that the pain of relationships and the drama of relationships may cause us just to move those down our list of priorities and I mean we could say well I'm just done with family family is just too painful I was with a man this week that said that family is just too rough so I don't have anything to do with family anymore or we could say I'm done with men or I'm done with women okay I've had a bad relationship there and so you know I'm just done I, I don't need friends I have my pet right and so I don't need anybody else I'm just gonna go off the emotional relationship grid for a while and this is what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna retreat to be by myself and I'm, I'll be fine by myself and yet Jesus says to love God with all and love others as yourself. Because a life without relationships maybe at first may seem a whole lot simpler, but it's not life at all. There's no life there. So with all of the cheap substitutes that we might move in to supplant or fill the need for a relationship, they're just that. They're just cheap substitutes because our relationship with God and with people those are more important and we know that I don't think anybody says well I think now that I'm going to put money ahead of my family nobody does that we, we all know this is true no, no one sets out to have a detached relationship from from their spouse no one says well now that we were married last week, I think that I'll just neglect my wife for the rest of my life. We, we, we know that relationships are very important. We know that God is first. We know that others are next. And that relationships are the most important. We know it. But the reality is, is that even if we do it sometimes, we probably don't do it as much as what we think that we do it. You hear what I'm saying? And the proof is in the doing. The knowing's important, but there's a disconnect between what we know, what we say is important, and what we actually do. And why is that? Well, because there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of fierce competition. We sit down in the morning, and we're going to have our, our prayer time. So we open up our tablet or we open up our phone to read our scripture perhaps is how that's how we do that and up at the top of the news feed there's somebody oh she posted on Facebook I'll see what she says there's another one there's another one oh check my email go to my email 15 minutes later oh my time's gone I've got to get ready for work well I'll get that tonight right there's a lot of competition your friend is sharing what's happened to her in her life this week. And as she's sharing this, and you know that this is bad, what's going on, 
you're, you're going through the list that's in your head of what you had planned for the rest of the evening because now you're going to be delayed. See, I've got to listen to her, right? It's a lot of competition. Your spouse is talking about something, and there's a news alert that comes on TV. And, excuse me, what? Oh, yeah, excuse I, I wasn't listening. Uh, you been there, done that? You're, you're writing your sermon on the importance of relationships. <laughs> and your wife sends a text about what are we doing for dinner. And how could she interrupt me at this time? Right? There's a lot of competition out there. Now, imagine at the end of your life that you are received by Jesus, who has taken you to heaven by his grace. And as you arrive in the presence of Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, and all the wonderful things, you're ushered into your own media room, where there's a giant screen, there's a cushy couch to sit on, there's giant big gulps of sugary drinks that what, add no pounds to you because those are gone in heaven. There's buttered popcorn. All of you are going, how do I get saved, right? <clears throat> There's buttery popcorn that will add nothing to your waist because this is heaven, right? And you're going to watch a video that, that Jesus has put together of all the times in your life where you gave 100% attention to the person that you were with, and that includes God. And so he's got a DVD that he's assembled. And this is every time in your life where you gave 100% attention to the person or persons that you were with, including to God. How long is that DVD going to be? You're going to be sitting there to eat that whole box of popcorn? Or it's, it's just, just a teaser, kind of, you know. It'll be a 45-second video? Is there going to be a 45-day video? How many scenes will depict you just relishing the moment of what's going on right now? And how many scenes will, will it be of us trying to multitask in our minds with so much stuff going on of our divided attention? It's not easy, is it? And we could give so many reasons as to why we give relationships less attention and um, less attention than what we say that we want, but really understanding why doesn't have a whole lot of power in changing it. And why would I say that, understanding why? Because we normally think that if I understand why, then it will change. And it's because when we do, <coughs> excuse me, when we do reflection, I'm gonna need a glass of water, <coughs> if you will, please. When we understand, when, when we do self-reflection and trying to internally change something by doing internal reflection, it just doesn't work very well. Thank you, Carrie. Allergies. Just this week I was, uh, I was delivering food boxes and there was a man that when I knocked on the door of his house. There was no answer, but I heard somebody from the backyard and he said, I'm back here. And I looked around the corner of his house and he was sitting outside and I never see this man outside. He's always kind of sequestered in this little room in the back of his house. His health is really bad. He's not that old, but his health is bad. But Monday, he was sitting out in the sun in a lawn chair and I thought, oh, that, that's nice to see him out there in his backyard enjoying himself. and. He said, go ahead, Don, and, and put the food in the house. So I did that. And I spoke to him briefly while running the schedule through my head of what I had put in here as I was going to do. So how was I going to get around to the locations I had to go and what I was going to do the rest of the day? And I saw him sitting out in the backyard. So I began to leave, and I looked at him over there, and he was sitting out, and there was another chair beside him, and you know, it's kind of like the, the little devil was over here on one side and the little angel over here like you used to have in the cartoons and they start whispering in your ear, you know, and the devil says, there's no reason for you to stay. You're a good man. You've given him his food. 
he's out there, you know. What, what, there's no need to stay. There's no re- Look, nobody else is doing what you're doing today. You don't get paid to do this. You're better than most people already, Don. Just get in your truck. You're a very busy man. There's no reason to stay there. And, you know, I fought it. The other voice wasn't that strong, but, but I fought it. And I actually went over, and this is rare, I actually went over and sat down next to him, and we talked about sports. He's a Cincinnati fan, but we talked about sports, and we talked about gardening, and we talked about his family and his health, and we talked about Jesus. He's a believer, and he talked about Yeshua with me. And we just had a, you know, it's probably 15 minutes that we sat there in the sun. It's very enjoyable. And I was leaving to my, leaving, I just thought to myself, I said, man, you really are the exceptional guy, aren't you? You are really quite the man. Now, I tell you that because this is the one instance what I did, what I thought Jesus would do. And there are hundreds of other times when I don't do what I know Jesus would do. And I know that I'm not as good as all of you, but I would guess that you have some times when you know what Jesus would do, and yet you choose not to do that because of that inner dialogue that's going on up there. There, there are hundreds of times when I don't, don't do it because of this imaginary schedule that I have in my head. It's like you know, the reality was I could have sat there with him for four hours. I had no appointments. I could have sat there with him for four hours and talked to him that day, and it wouldn't have made any difference in my life whatsoever. But I had this imaginary schedule that I have in my mind of things that I want to do that said, those are more important, these things that you've created, than this man that's sitting there. It's our inner dialogue. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get this done on time so I can do this, right? And even when we realize that I am not putting my relationships first, it's so difficult to change. It really is, because we've got this stuff going on up there all the time. It's complicated. You see, in that situation, if someone could have heard my inner dialogue and then asked me questions as I'm making my decisions to go or stay, <clears throat> I would have answered every question correctly. So, are you really busy, Don? No, not really. Not today. I'm not really busy. Do you have an appointment? No. No, I don't really have an appointment. Do you think the man is of value? Well, yes, I think this man's of value. Would you help this man if he asked you to? Definitely I would stop and help this man if he asked me to. Which is more important, Don, your time or this man? Well, this man's more important than my time. Do you really want to live like Jesus lived? Yes, I do. Do you think he would sit down with the man in the sun and talk to him for a while? Yes, I do. I would have answered every question correctly, and yet I still would have got in my truck and drove away, because that's what we do a lot, don't we? I would have known what to do, and yet I would not have done it, just like I've chosen things over relationships thousands of times. Why? Well, because lesser values overwhelm the greater values. I know that doesn't sound right, but it is correct. The things that we say we value less, like money and time, being relevant, being cool, entertainment, excitement, privacy, freedom, the list goes on and on and on of, of things that, are, that we value, but we say that we value less. All those lesser values take less faith and they take less effort than the ultimate value of the relationship with Jesus Christ and our relationship with other people. You have to have more faith to put your relationships first than all those other things. The lesser things, the money, the, the entertainment, the, the popularity, the excitement, they're all easy and they don't take a lot of effort. They take less effort, you see. And that's why God says, love me with all. He doesn't say love me with most or some or a whole lot. He says, love me with all. And, you know, those lesser values push that out. And all we have to do is to say, I'm really busy. I'm really busy today. I don't have to do that. 
You know, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the time. It's not easy to pay attention to people that we're with. It's easy to stay busy. It's so much more difficult to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's, that's not an easy thing to do. Lesser values push that out of us. And we can't love God with all and love other things at the same time. They're not compatible. We can't love God with all we are and still have other things that we love, lesser values that we love. Ultimate values don't share with lesser values. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus said it this way, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Ultimate values don't share with lesser values. And it's not just money. I mean, it's, it's anything and everything but God. It's anything and everything but the people that I'm in relationship with. Everything else is less. Nothing else lasts. Only our relationship with God and our relationship with people lasts. Everything else rots and goes away. God and people are forever, and they are the ultimate value. And we know that. But do you have faith? that that is true. It says two different things. We can know that, but to have faith to live by that to be true is a completely different arena. If we believe that is true, then we would have faith to live by that principle. And it does not, it does take faith to put our relationships with God and people first above all else. Jesus did. We might say, well, Things were a lot easier back then. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have TV, right? Things were a lot easier. It was slower. You know, Jesus was constantly interrupted. His ministry is one of interruptions. In fact, if you pay attention, he went from one interruption to another interruption to another interruption. And he never, never did he say, man, can't you see I'm busy saving the world here? Get in line. Never once did he say that. And he just went from interruption to interruption. And it, it wasn't because he had handlers or spinners, you know, people that would make the God of this world look like the average guy. He was fine with interruptions. But relationships first, the Father and the people. Thought of a few times, just, just a few examples. In Mark 5, he's got so many people crowding around him there in Capernaum that he can hardly move. And a man comes and he begs him to hurry to his house because his daughter is dying, he thinks. And there's hundreds of people and Jesus is trying to make his way to Jairus' house. And, and there's just too many people for him to go. And while he's going there, some lady, it says that she has had uh, an issue of blood which makes her unclean, which means that she can't be around any good people, okay? She's off bounds. And she touches the hem of his coat, and he goes, who touched me? And he turns around and heals her right there. And because of that, he's late to getting to the man's house. But he takes that interruption. Another occasion, his disciples have not learned this important principle. And so there are some parents there with their children, and they want Jesus to touch the children and just to kind of bestow the blessing of the rabbi on the children. And the disciples do what we would do in our world system, and they say, it's not a good time. You know, bring, bring, there's too many people right now. Bring them back later. They're just kids. They'll understand, you know. And what does Jesus say? Bring the little children to me now, for such is the kingdom of God. He's interrupted, but that's all right. Because you see, the kids are on the same level as the adults. Another occasion, last occasion I thought of, he, he's leaving Capernaum, and he and his disciples are so tired. Uh, the mobs have been around them. He says that he's been healing everyone. And so they're going to go on a retreat, just a short prayer retreat. And they go to a desolate spot. And when they get to the desolate spot, 5,000 people have beat them there kind of ruins your retreat, right? 5,000 people make it there before Jesus does and the disciples. <coughs> so what does he do? He says, where'd all these people come from? Let's go someplace else. No, it says that he teaches them all day. It gets close to evening. They're hungry. The disciples come and they go, 
We need to send the people home. They're hungry. You know what Jesus says to them? He says, you feed them. In other words, if you think relationships are important, 12, then have faith that God will act in that. You feed them, is what he tells them. Every interruption was a opportunity for God. Every person was important, and that's how he did relationships. Now, that's really the bulk of what I had to say today. I want to end with one thing that might give you a little bit of hope. Every time we talk about relationships, for some reason, if you're a human being, uh, you probably go to your negative relationships first. As a matter of fact, when you learned that this was about relationships, you probably started thinking about somebody that you're not quite right with right now. Okay? And I want to make this point, is that Jesus was not successful in all of his relationships. Not successful in the term that we would think of successful. They were not all tens, to put it that way. When we look at the total of his relationships, some of them were rather stressful. Uh, we have times when our relationships are painful, and Jesus was no different. Um, you know, he got kicked out of his hometown. Think about bearing that. They kicked him out of Nazareth. They did. Uh, it's there in Luke 4. Said the wrong thing. They ran him out of town. He didn't go back. From, that, from then on, he was down at Capernaum. Now, that's a, rough, that's a rough relationship ending to have the guys that you went to school with run you out of town, you know? But that's what happened to him. His family, well, at times his family really didn't get what was going on. There's one incident there in Mark where it says that his family came to bring him home because he was not in his right mind. What that means was that they were saying that he had a demon. Okay, so they come to take him home. His brother James doesn't believe until after the resurrection. His family relationships weren't the best, okay? And then, of course, the, his dealings with the Pharisees, um, the kind of the in charge guys at the time, um, he ends up calling them snakes. So, we, we can't look at his relationships and say, well, they were all tens because they weren't. All of those things happened because of someone else's misunderstanding of who he was and their inability to handle who he was as the Messiah. And yet, they were relationships that were not successful. They were stressful. So we learn first from him that our relationships are most important, but even when we do that, they may not be whole or they may not be pleasant. God does not force others to do the right thing or to adopt the values that we have. And so even if you're doing everything correctly, everything the way that Jesus would be doing it, you can still have some stressful, conflicted relationships. Okay, let me just, just touch just briefly on, on where we've been here. Relationships are the most important. Right? There's competition for number one in your life. There's always competition for, for your for first value. Lesser values are easier. So it takes faith and effort to live for the highest values. And our relationships are not always successful. Uh, we're going to enjoy this together. Let's, let's have a prayer and we'll close service. As deep cries out